The shock resignation of Ireland's Taoiseach, or Prime Minister, Leo Varadkar, really did come out of the blue. There's been a speculation frenzy as to why, but no clear answers. So what do we know and what happens next? Hello and welcome to Roundtable. I'm Enda Brady. Now, it was such an unexpected announcement, the Irish Times had less than an hour's notice. But after a number of unpopular policies and big falls in popularity, perhaps Leo Varadkar is right that it is time to move on. There's still a country to govern, so who's taking the top job? And is an election on the horizon in Ireland? My reasons for stepping down are both personal and political. However, politicians are human beings and we have our limitations. We give it everything until we can't anymore, and then we have to move on. The lack of a clear explanation following this statement from Leo Varadkar on why he stepped down has led to plenty of speculation. Some theories point to a speech he made just five days earlier at the White House, challenging the US position on Gaza. The Irish people are deeply troubled about the catastrophe that's unfold, unfolding before our eyes in Gaza. We see our history in their eyes, a story of displacement, of dispossession, a national identity questioned and denied, forced emigration, discrimination, and now hunger. But in reality, the declining electoral prospects of Varadkar's Fine Gael party may have had more to do with it. While he's received praise in Ireland for his stance on Gaza, there's frustration over many other issues. I have two young kids. I am worried about what's ahead for the people of Ireland. Um, you know, there's a lot of problems in the country. There's a lot of issues. Hospitals are on their knees. You know, I can't even get my child into a daycare centre. Support for Fine Gael has fallen from a peak of 35% in 2020, when Varadkar was praised for his leadership during the COVID pandemic, to 19% in April 2023. It hasn't recovered since. And in early March, Varadkar suffered a resounding defeat in a double referendum on redefining the term family and on the role of women in the country's constitution. Opposition party Sinn Féin now leads the polls and is pushing for a general election. But Fine Gael could wait until the latest legal date possible in March 2025. So will its new leader, Simon Harris, elected unopposed within the party and set to become Ireland's next and youngest Taoiseach, turn its fortunes around, or is it too little, too late? Well, let's meet our guests. In Dublin is Fionnán Sheehan. He is Ireland editor at the Irish Independent. And Brendan Kieran brown assistant professor of conflict resolution at Trinity College Dublin. And in Belfast, Deirdre Heenan. Professor of Social Policy at Ulster University. And here with me in the studio is Scarlett Maguire, former Labour Party advisor in the United Kingdom. Uh, come to you first, Fionnán. Leo Varadkar's legacy, how will Irish people remember him? He was our, our youngest uh, ever uh, Taoiseach, uh, taking up office at the age of 38 at the time. He was uh, of an ethnic background as well. His, his dad, uh, is a doctor who emigrated to Ireland from, from India in the early stages of, of, of his, his career. And he, he was also, uh, came out as gay just a couple of years before becoming uh, Taoiseach. And that was seen as a very important moment uh, in our, our, our crossover into same-sex marriage uh, after a historic referendum. So he, he broke a lot of ground in, in that. He will be remembered for issues like his handling of major crises, uh, such as Brexit and fending off any prospect that there would be a border on the island of Ireland, uh, effectively between uh, the EU and the UK, because Ireland and Northern Ireland are effectively the, the front line of all, of all of that. He'll also be remembered for his, his handling of, of COVID-19, uh, where Ireland seemed to fare better than, than very many other countries, including the, the UK, uh, seemed to be more stable, more uh, more proactive in terms of, of decision making and, and handling it in a more sensible uh, fashion. I suppose what the downsides though will be uh, the housing crisis in Ireland got progressively worse uh, 
over recent uh, years and his government continued to, to struggle with that. Deirdre, he did play a very good hand, didn't he, with the Brexit situation? I mean, the UK was very much pushing towards reintroducing a land border on the island of Ireland, and Varadkar stood his ground. I mean, a lot of people should be grateful to him in Ireland, shouldn't they? Oh, I think in the North that will be his legacy. A lot of people um, are grateful that he championed the cause of Ireland during the Brexit negotiations. He was bullish in his stance that the idea of a return to a hard border on this island was simply untenable, something that he was not going to give an inch on, something that was not up for negotiation. And there was a feeling, of course, that he was up against the UK. Could he hold the line? He not only held the line, he brought the other EU countries in behind him, and this became a matter of principle. So I think he, he found himself as a figure of hate amongst uh, some hard right conservatives in the UK, a figure of hate by uh, many unionists in the North. But for many people in Ireland, he will be remembered for that bullish stance that he was simply saying, this is not up for negotiation. We were in the eye of the storm, the Brexit negotiations for six years. And there was some comfort in the fact that there was a belief that he would hold this line and he wouldn't give way. In many ways, uh, Leo Varadkar was a breath of fresh air. It is important to remember that before this, Ireland was one of the most socially conservative countries in the world. He came along as the youngest Taoiseach, someone who was openly gay, someone who challenged norms. So I think he will be remembered for that as well. But of course, there is a mixed legacy in terms of his record in health, with vulnerable populations, his record, of course, in housing. And I think really, maybe on reflection, he should have not come back for a second term. He had made a name, he had a, a legacy after his first term in office. And really, when you reflect on his second term in office, it's hard to say what he achieved there, other than presiding over the status quo. There was no imprimatur on new policies around health around housing and he did seem to be disengaged. I was in Washington with him just before he announced his resignation and many people commented on the fact that he appeared to be disengaged, not really interested in the conversations, looked tired and just felt like maybe he'd had enough. Brendan, I found it fascinating that news of his resignation did not leak out in advance, literally nobody knew. I mean, that was quite an achievement in itself. Yeah, it, it took a lot of us by surprise. Um, and I guess it led to some conspiracy theories, people thinking that perhaps um, because he had been so vocal uh, in front of Joe Biden uh, about the Palestine situation, that perhaps he had been uh, pushed. But I think we can quickly debunk that as... Um, yeah, complete speculation. Um, I, I would echo exactly what uh, my two colleagues have said. I mean, I do think there are some very interesting aspects to his legacy. Certainly, um, he was a figure that revealed Ireland's move away slightly from conservatism. But I guess also I would look at the current state of affairs uh, in, in Ireland as a whole. I mean, I spend time listening to my students in, in Trinity in Dublin talking about the, the cost of living crisis, talking about the housing crisis, talking about the fact they can't get a room for less than 800 euros uh, to rent. And I think that perhaps more could have been done really to to challenge some of these issues. And, you know, it's it's important that we, we highlight the key things around Brexit. And I also think um, the, the strong message that he did deliver uh, as a medical person during COVID was was very important. But again, there's a lot of work to be done uh, in Ireland uh, at this moment in time to really level out the playing field, to make it a more equitable and a fairer place for everyone. So certainly a bit of a mixed legacy from what I would say. Scarlett, Leo Varadkar joins quite a group of prime ministers who have stood down at a relatively young age in just the last year. So if we look at it, You've got Jacinda Ardern, Prime Minister of New Zealand from 2017 to 2023. She resigned saying she no longer had the energy to go on as leader. Nicola Sturgeon, First Minister of Scotland. She was Scotland's longest serving and first ever 
female first minister. She resigned due to allegations of financial misconduct, which she denies. Elizabeth Bourne was Prime Minister of France for two years until 2024. Um, she resigned as a result of a number of unpopular policies by her government. And Antonio Costa, Prime Minister of Portugal from 2015, for eight years, he stepped down over a corruption probe. Are we seeing a stage where politicians see political life as just one career and then they move on? Because in the United Kingdom, we've been very used to people like, you know, Tony Benn, Ken Clark, uh, a lot of politicians just staying on perhaps too long. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think it, it's a mixture. I think if you go in young, um, it, it does burn you out. There's, there's absolutely no question that, 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 that you look at a prime minister and they, they age so fast w when they're in there. But you come out and what is there to do? Well, <clears throat> make money. is So obviously Boris Johnson has gone off to make money. But what's interesting about politics, certainly in Britain, is it's absolutely, it, it's completely addictive. I mean, look at David Cameron. He had he, to come back. He had to come back. And, and, and what everybody's saying, people who really know him are saying he's coming back because he had such a terrible legacy because he failed over Brexit. And frankly, there were problems over Libya and other things. And he's come back to do the foreign policy much better. And, and it's quite interesting. Boris Johnson is waiting to be called back. Margaret Thatcher uh, was forced out, waiting to be called back. Um, Tony Blair really really wanted to be uh, president of Europe and the world, frankly. Didn't, um, work, out. Or didn't work out. Iraq, his decisions over Iraq. So, I mean, I think that the problem is that the, the politi is, is they think they can leave it behind, but actually it's addictive. Fiona, tell us a bit about the new tea shock. What do we know about Simon Harris? Who is he? Yeah, so at, at 37 years of age, in two weeks' time, he will become our youngest ever Taoiseach, beating Leo Bradcar's record uh, by one year. He has been a, a minister for the past decade at senior cabinet level uh, for the past eight years, uh, minister for health and then minister for higher education. Uh, and not a great record there. As Minister for Health, he very much struggled to, to make any progress whatsoever. During COVID-19, he was seen as a, a very straight communicator, but he very much followed the science. Uh, what the, the health and medical advisors uh, were guiding, he quite clearly said he just went along uh, with, with, with their, with their uh, advice. He got into politics at a very young age uh, as a, a teenager. Uh, his, his brother was diagnosed with autism. He campaigned for, for services. Uh, in that area, and he became a, the youngest member of our, our parliament uh, at just 24 years of age back in 2011 when Ireland was coming through uh, an economic crisis. So he, he really has had a, a meteoric rise up through the ranks. Deirdre, talk us through some of the issues in the intray then for the new Taoiseach, our Prime Minister of Ireland. Oh, well, there are many issues. I, I would suspect immigration will be the number one issue, how to deal with uh, immigration, how to allay fears amongst the public, fears that we have witnessed across the UK for years, how to ensure that people who are coming to Ireland are integrated into society, how to, I think really there has been a, a denial of the rise of the far right in Ireland, uh, a belief that it can't really happen here. Ireland is the place of a thousand welcomes. But I think that is dangerous. There is a rise in the far right, and I think the government have to show that they have a handle on it and that they are dealing with it. And of course, then the housing crisis. As has already been mentioned, for many people getting onto home ownership is out of their reach. It's virtually impossible. And for young people, they are looking around them saying, why would I stay here? We have a crisis in health across this island because many of our skilled, savvy young people are saying, there isn't a future for me here. There isn't a future for my family here. I'm going to go to Australia, New Zealand, where there are better opportunities and I can get onto that property ladder. And across the classes, there are issues with housing. So I think he has got to come and first of all, show that he recognizes there are problems in those two areas. And then secondly, be very clear about what he intends to do about it. We are lacking serious policies. Um, I thought it was quite interesting. One of the papers described him as rising without a trace. Um, from the perspective of the North, we actually know very little about Simon Harris. 
other than he's a career politician. He hasn't been outside. He hasn't had a career outside politics. He hasn't run a business. And you're always suspicious that perhaps someone who's been in that political bubble, insulated from real life, as it were, do they actually understand the stresses of ordinary people in terms of a cost of living crisis, in terms of their worries around their family, in terms of the big issues around housing, integration and education. So I think he has a lot to prove in a short time and it cannot be business as usual. This is not the continuity Taoiseach. He has got to understand that there are real problems within the country. And one of the biggest problems is that people feel they are not listened to, that uh, government pay lip service to the problems that people are actually dealing with. And yes, of course, they can point to economic success. They can point to prosperity and having a huge surplus. But that is utterly irrelevant to people who cannot afford to stay in the country because they can't get a secure home. In the end, the secure home should be the number one priority. So I will be very interested to see how quickly he comes out of the blocks, firstly, with a recognition of the scale and the nature of the problem, and then secondly, telling us in no uncertain terms about what he plans to do about it. Because the time for rhetoric and honeyed words about understanding, I think people have run out of patience with that. Brendan, one thing that has struck me in recent months, speaking to family and friends across Ireland, is the level of anger, disillusionment, disgruntlement, if you will. I mean, people are getting quite sick of the political class. Is that a fair assessment? Well, I think so. And I think for all the reasons that uh, Deirdre has mentioned, um, you know, it isn't an easy place to live well. I mean, people come to Ireland, as I say, I've met them, I've met students from all over the world who comment really seriously on their inability to enjoy all that Ireland has to offer. And we have lots to offer. Um, and I think that's a real shame. And people do feel that they're not being listened to. And there is an, a sense amongst lots of people that there is a lot of internal corruption, dare I say, within uh, the upper echelons of the Irish government at this moment in time. So I do think we have a lot of work to do to try and convince people to engage with the political system, to regain trust in the political system. Um, that, you know, we saw recently a, a number of votes that the Irish uh, government to, to put to the people that failed, that didn't get passed. And I think that's a good indication as well as to how people are engaging uh, with our political representatives in the South. So, yeah, we have a lot of challenges here. Um, Simon Harris has a lot of work to do, um, rather him than me. Scarlett, Simon Harris becomes Taoiseach in Ireland because his party, nobody has gone up against him. There's not going to be a general election. The public don't get a say in this. Much the same as what has happened in your country. In the UK, Rishi Sunak became Prime Minister without an election because the Conservative Party voted him in. Liz Truss, bless her, for six weeks, he got in. Uh, Boris Johnson, albeit he did then win an election. But this keeps happening, doesn't it? What does that say to the electorate that parties are pushing people in? Well, to the electorate, it says we don't we don't really care about you, and and it and it's it's it, it so basically Simon Harris needs to have an election, um, even though he might lose it. Right. And actually, Rishi Sunak should have had an election. Liz Truss should have had an election. That's what people expect. If you get a new leader, you don't want a prime minister that is well in Simon Harris's case elected by nobody just like Rishi Sunak, it, 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 nobody in the end stood against him, but it, it was just the MPs. Liz Truss, it was the Tories. What well, Tory membership. Tory membership is so unlike the rest of the country. I mean, A, they're much older, you know, um, the, the average age is sort of hitting 60. They're much better off. They tend to be wh white. Concentrated in the South. And concentrated in the South. Yeah. So actually, out of respect, I think you should always have a general election. Fiona, he's not going to, though, is he? Because the polls are pretty dire for Fine Gael and their coalition partners, Fianna Fáil. Yeah, but in our, our constitution, it, it specifies you have to have a, a general election every five years. Uh, so that's the mandate that, that is given to our, our parliament to elect a, a prime minister. And that's what's happening uh, on, on this occasion. But yeah, on, on, on the flip side, it, it's not attractive to him. To, to go to the polls either, whether he does it in the autumn or, or next spring. 
uh, that will that will be the, the time to do it. In the intervening period, he does in three months' time have local and European elections, which will be very significant because we are seeing that immigration is emerging as a very prominent uh, issue amongst the Irish voters. And on a, on a in a, a case like a local and European election, that is it is quite likely that that dissatisfaction with how issues like that have been handled will be expressed uh, at the ballot box. Deirdre, talk to me about Sinn Féin and their leader, Mary Lou Macdonald, because she has been riding quite high in the polls and she's calling for an immediate general election now. Well, of course she has. Uh, I'd be very surprised if she didn't. She would see this as an opportunity for her and her party to say that actually we don't want more of the same. This government have failed and it's time for a general election and <clears throat> give the public their say. So of course she's going to say that. I think the issue for her is she needs to tell people what exactly are they going to do? What are they offering that is different? Are Sinn Féin really a government in waiting? And if they are, for example, what are their answers to the housing crisis? What are their answers to the immigration problem? So I think there's also a, a, a focus on our newly restored government in the north, because, as you will know, uh, we now have a Sinn Féin first minister, and people are watching very carefully to say, yes, the optics look great. We're in a very short honeymoon period, but people here in the north want to see delivery. We've had an atrocious record of our devolved government, particularly in terms of health, education and the economy. So yes, it's all well and good that they are back and there are now uh, lots of photo shots, lots of cutting of ribbons, but we have yet to see any real policies, not one piece of legislation. So I think people who are thinking about Sinn Féin government in the South will be looking to the North and saying, how, do these, how does this party actually perform in government? And it's not about photo shots. It's not about uh, warm words. It's about saying there are serious social and economic problems here. What are we doing about them? Brendan, Mary Lou Macdonald of Sinn Féin, she certainly talks a good game. Do you think she can deliver for people in Ireland? Well, I mean, it's a million dollar question. I mean, anybody that makes predictions in politics at the moment, I think, is, um, is foolish to do that. Um, I think she says a lot of important things, but as Deirdre has said, we need to see tangible uh, output. We need to see really clearly what it is uh, that Sinn Féin are planning um, to, to solve a lot of these crises that we have before us. Um, and even just, just looking at, uh, at the situation in the North, I mean, we have a healthcare system that is absolutely on its knees. My wife is a doctor in the NHS and I've seen firsthand just how atrocious the situation is, um, not just for those working in the NHS, but for patients as well. So we do need to see much more than uh, soft gestures. We need to see plans. We need to see uh, the bigger picture. And I, also, I would also say that we need to have conversations around what potential unity would look like on the island, dare I say it, because I do think that represents opportunities. And I know people are nervous about putting these, uh, putting this out there and perhaps rocking the apple cart further. But I really do think the time to have serious conversations around looking at unity, planning for the future, moving beyond um, exp you know, what we currently are experiencing and, and trying to strategize bigger uh, is something that we should be looking at. So it remains to be seen if uh, Sinn Féin um, and under Mary Lou Macdonald's leadership will make these decisive changes. I hope so. It would be good for all of us, but uh, it remains to be seen. Scarlett, when a governing party changes leader with less than 12 months to go legally until the very last moment they can have a general election, what sort of challenges does that present when, you know, getting a new leader introduced to the public and settling in and time is really ticking every day? Time is really ticking, but they often get a honeymoon period. Um, and that's what we expected with Liz Truss, who, who never... <laughs> <laughs> never ever had it. I mean, I mean, the Conservatives went down the polls. Rishi barely, Rishi Sunak, our present Prime Minister, barely got a, a, a honeymoon period. I mean, it, it depends if you're coming in because somebody's tired. So, so Gordon Brown came in after Tony Blair. He pretty much forced Tony Blair out. He said there was a deal that that there was a question mark over. Uh, he did get a honeymoon period. And, but actually, what, what was interesting was he was on the way down when we got the financial crisis, in which he behaved 
wonderfully never got any credit that 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 was the end so what 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 a new leader needs to do is to say I think what we've done is okay, but what I'm going to do, they need to have lots of ideas, um, lots of, w w this is how we're going to change it. But they also need to, they need to slightly break away from the past. Sean, final question to you, just briefly. Can Simon Harris turn this around quickly for Fine Gael? It's a very short time period that, that he's got to, to make any significant impact. Uh, less than a year. Uh, Fine Gael, his party are on their third term in government now. Anywhere in the world, uh, governments tend to get, when parties are in that long, they tend to get tired and tend to get stale. Uh, it's difficult to see what dramatic changes and fortunes he can bring about uh, within the, this, this short time period. So maybe it'll help his party and, and they'll get a bit of a boost uh, off it, but I, I don't see it as a as a substantial redrawing of the political map. Fionnan, Brendan, Deirdre and Scarlett, thank you all so much for your insight. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Search for Roundtable TRT World. But for now, from me and the Brady and all of the team here, goodbye and thank you for watching.